come up and they'll, they'll speak on the microphone for about four minutes. And uh, at that time, we'll, we'll switch those in and out. We have our first debate style uh, coming up a little bit later on with the mayor candidates and then the sheriffs later on tonight. But we're going to start off with candidate for road superintendent, Benton Bartlett. I am Benton Bartlett and I'm running for re-election for Coffee County Road Superintendent. Uh, we've had a lot of good things happen over the, really over the whole state the last couple of four years. Uh, first of all, the economy got a lot better. The gas prices went down. There's been a record amount of gas and fuel sold, which is uh, a record amount of gas tax collected. Uh, and since our 95% of our operating income comes directly from the gas tax, it has helped our budget tremendously. Uh, when I took office in 2014, I, I, we had a lot of work to do. Uh, first of all, the money we had to operate on was was kind of low. We had a uh, had a note that we had to pay on, and from very early on, I decided to stay within our budget, try to get out of debt, and uh, I'm happy to say, in the last three and a half years, our highway department is debt free. And not only that, but we have a healthy surplus right now. Uh, the springtime is when we have the most money. The summertime is when we spend the most money. So uh, in the next few months, we've got a lot of work we can do, and we're, we're looking really forward to doing, getting that done. My goal is to have the best county roads in Tennessee, and with the great talented staff that I have working with me at the highway department, it can happen. Vote Benton Bartlett for Coffee County Highway Superintendent and get four more years of improvement. Thank you. All right, thank you, Benton is Ronnie Watts here tonight. All right, our next uh, candidate also for road superintendent is Ronnie Dale Watts. Good evening everybody, I'm glad everybody's here, good crowd. Uh, I'm Ronnie Watts and uh, this is my third time running for this and I'm hoping to get it this time, and I've got 43 years of road building experience, and I used to be the assistant road superintendent from 2010-2014, uh, and uh, Mr. Barber was talking about the budget. I don't know how much it was when he took off, but over, but uh, I, don't, I didn't keep up with the money that much, but uh, I want to, first thing, if I'm elected, I'll go back to a five-day work week, and safety is my big pro uh, priority of the people who works there and of the public too, and keeping the uh, equipment up to date and worked on, cleaned up. Uh, just a lot of things involved in this office, which I know if I win, what I can expect, and you've got to serve a whole lot of people. It's about 636 miles of county roads to maintain. And it's a whole lot of maintenance there. And ditching, paving, shoulder work, tree work, just whatever. Uh, it's a whole lot of work. And I believe I can handle it. And I appreciate your vote. And like I say, I've been doing this 43 years and I've had my own company for about 15 years paving and stuff off and on. And I appreciate everybody coming here, and I appreciate all of your votes. Thank you.
I'm Lucky Don uh, with Thunder Radio. Next uh, will be our trustee candidates. Uh, there has been a uh, slight change. I'll let you guys know that uh, we've kind of flip-flopped a couple of things. If you see a schedule, there's a couple of things that had to be done. Someone needed to be at a meeting, and so we have changed some things around. That'll be a little bit later on in our program. We'll tell you more about that in a little bit. But our uh, first trustee candidate is the incumbent, John Marchesoni. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to thank the Manchester Times, Thunder Radio 1320, and Steve West for allowing us to be here tonight. To all of you here and those that are listening on the air, I appreciate your time and your interest in your community. Coffee County has been my home for 51 years. My wife, Beth, is employed with the Manchester City School System, and our son, Denton, will graduate from Middle Tennessee State University in May. I was a self-employed businessman for 22 years before you elected me as your trustee four years ago. I thank the voters who trust me to serve and I appreciate the confidence. The responsibility of the trustee's office is to send out tax statements, collect the property taxes, disperse the funds, receipt the monies, and invest any idle monies at the best, pop, best rate possible. Because you entrust me with your hard-earned funds, the trustee's office demands an individual with dedication, responsibility, and integrity. Dedication begins with providing the taxpayer and other governmental offices with the accountability of completing the duties required by the trustee's office. Responsibility is a learned habit. My mother, Pauline, taught me that early in life. And integrity is practicing strict morals with any and all individuals at all times. Integrity is earned by doing what is right and following the golden rule. With a yearning to excel as your trustee, I've experienced many rewards in this short amount of time. The University of Tennessee Institute for Public Service allowed me to earn a certified public administrator designation. I was honored when Middle Tennessee Trustee Association recognized me as trustee for the year 2017. These rewards indicate my dedication to the Office of Trustee but I consider the greatest award as the opportunity to serve all of you. Now, from a business standpoint, our product at the trustee's office is serving you and working with other governmental offices. Outstanding service is practiced on a daily basis through the efforts of Sheila Ballou, Leona West, Vicki Blondin, and Carolyn Welburn. We're all available to help you with your needs. We can't pay your taxes. But I appreciate their dedication. I appreciate their integrity. And I appreciate their service to the people of Coffee County. In closing, I'd like to ask for your support, your confidence, and your vote. Thank you very much. Is uh, candidate Robin Dunn for trustee. Good evening. My name is Robin Dunn and I am running for Coffee County Trustee. And as I've met with several citizens across the county over the past several weeks, I've introduced myself as not just a math person, but a people person. I come from a long line of farmers, veterans, and teachers. And so when it was time for me to choose an occupation, I chose teacher. I went to the University of Tennessee and earned a degree in mathematics and over the past decade I have shared my passion of numbers with the future generation. And working this long in public education, I know that all people, regardless of their zip code, 
and regardless of who their parents are, are deserving of dignity and respect. And those are two things that I freely give. And that's why I believe I was chosen as Teacher of the Year by my colleagues and also elected alderman in Tullahoma just last summer. Because I'm not just a math person, I'm a people person. I care deeply about this county and the people in it. And I'm devoted to being fiscally responsible as the Coffee County trustee. So what is fiscal responsibility? We hear that word a lot, right? What does it mean to me? Well, the state of Tennessee is running for the very first time in state history 100% debt free. Every single project that was performed last year by the state was done so with cash. So yeah, that's awesome. Um, that happened because Governor Bredesen several years ago created a rainy day fund and Governor Haslam during his tenure kept it going. So while I can't do that alone as the Coffee County trustee, I will be working in partnership with your elected mayor, with your elected commissioners, with your elected officers so that we can work together to get to that goal, to being a debt-free county. Let's put us on that path. Right now as Tullahoma Alderman, I've been working with our accountant to protect our rainy day fund and I'm really glad we have it because just a couple of weeks ago, Lincoln Street had a sinkhole that cost the, the city $50,000. It was very unexpected and had we not had our rainy day fund, we would have had to borrow every penny of that. As Coffee County trustee, I can assure you that I want to leave that office in better shape than when I found it. I want to work in partnership with the rest of your elected officials. And while I'm talking about partnership, let's talk about party lines for just a moment. Everyone in this room, regardless of your affiliation, we all want a safe school for our kids. We want a good education for our kids. We want our neighbors to have good jobs. We want a strong infrastructure. And we want our tax dollars spent wisely. So we, as voters, have to look beyond the D and the R and look at the leader behind those letters. Who is this person? Who are, who are they? Do I trust them to treat me with respect? Do I trust them to be forward thinking, to ask good questions, to look beyond the surface a little deeper to find solutions? Is this someone who's going to form relationships or tear them down? Because that is how a community is founded. So let me encourage you to vote for someone who's not just going to work hard, but work smart. Vote for a teacher, a business person's owner, uh, wife, a veteran's daughter, and a farmer's granddaughter. Not just a people person, but a math person. Or the other way around, math person, people person. I appreciate your vote. Thank you very much. Robin, I think you took off with my notes, too. <laughs> All the secret questions are on that. <laughs> They're not. They're under lock and key. We'll bring those in later. Okay. Next, we move on to our candidates for Kurt, uh, Circuit Court Clerk. It's a mouthful. Uh, first up will be incumbent Heather Duncan. Good evening, I'm Heather Hines Duncan, Coffee County Circuit Court Clerk. I would appreciate your vote for re-election on May 1st and August 2nd. For candidates, election time is a period of reflection. As I was preparing to share with you some facts and figures about the 24 years I've been Circuit Court Clerk, I thought to myself, those things were pretty significant numbers. But there are other things that I feel are more important that I want to share with you today. My having an accounting degree and a master's degree has really been beneficial to this office. Our office handles in excess of $6 million per year. We have over 25,000 active cases. With laws changing on a regular basis and new fines and fees being introduced, it can be a challenge to keep up with and account for. I can't imagine leading this office without having an accounting background. 
We have made significant improvements to this office. When I first walked in 24 years ago, we had a telephone, a fax machine, a copier, a checkbook, and a receipt book. Within 18 months, I had totally automated the accounting and case management systems. Today, we are one of the most technologically advanced circuit court clerk's office in the state. We take online and credit card payments for court costs and filing fees. We email, email hundreds of court dockets each week as opposed to copying them. We post our dockets online on the county's website and each day we email changes to the court calendar to all the users of the court system. I have proven my commitment to the citizens of Coffee County. I am a hands-on circuit court clerk. I know how to do my job and I do it each and every day. One thing I'm especially proud of is the collections department that we started a few years ago. I consider it a win-win investment for Coffee County. We meet with each citizen who is assessed court funds. We consolidate their total court indebtedness and put them on a payment plan. Nothing has been more rewarding than seeing these citizens take pride in having totally paid off their court fines and cost. At the same time, it has resulted in our office having one of the highest collection rates in the state of Tennessee. I'm a firm believer that staff empowerment, empowering staff with knowledge is always, always results in a more kind and understanding staff. Therefore, I encourage each employee of the Circuit Court Clerk's Office to go to training and education meetings regularly. In fact, our office was recently recognized for having 85% of our staff either working toward or having completed the public administrator stat certification. In the future, I will continue to use technology to maintain our high standard of efficiency and accuracy. I will continue to effectively provide information to ensure that we have well-informed citizens and I will always strive to have the best circuit court clerk's office in the state of Tennessee. I'm a lifelong resident of Coffee County. My family has been here for seven generations. I am a wife of 27 years and a mother of four children, two of whom are college students currently. I am as vested in the future of Coffee County as I am in the past. I am a property owner and a taxpayer, just like many of you here tonight. I keep that in mind every single year as I prepare, prepare our office budget. I am blessed to lead what I am certain is the most knowledgeable, well-trained, customer service oriented circuit court clerk's office in the state of Tennessee. We strive to serve the citizens of Coffee County better every single day. In conclusion, if you should find yourself in need walking into the circuit court clerk's office, you want to know you are met by a kind person who understands the importance of your situation and who knows how to handle your, your situation correctly. You want knowledge and experience waiting on that counter by, for you. Again, I appreciate your vote and your support. All right, thank you. She went about 15 seconds over, so we'll assess that fine on a payment plan. <laughs> We've got uh, one more candidate for uh, circuit court clerk. After that, we'll take a, a brief intermission, about five to ten minutes, to get the mayoral candidates ready, and uh, then we'll start that portion of the evening. Is uh, She is here. Our uh, next uh, candidate for circuit court clerk is Natalie Dotson. Good evening. My name is Natalie Brooke Dotson and I'm your Republican candidate for Circuit Court Clerk. In May, I will receive a Bachelor in Science degree from Tennessee Tech University in Human Ecology with a concentration in Child Development and Family Relations. I'm also a certified Level B assessor, which allows me to assess children and their developmental le level. With that, it is then my responsibility to make sure if they are below the curve that they get the resources that they need. The circuit court clerk's office works very closely with many people. The district attorney, the public defender's office, law enforcement, the judges, child support, but most importantly, they work with the public of Coffee County. 
My education has allowed me to work with many individuals from many different backgrounds, and I believe I can handle any situation that comes into the circuit court clerk office. One of the main concerns is communication. I believe in open lines of communication. I believe in an open door policy. With this, I believe that every circuit court clerk member should be cross-trained. They should be cross-trained within departments as allowed. I believe that every circuit court clerk officer or member should be able to give an account. There should never be a ripple even if one person is absent from the office. Also, there has been reported that there are files that have either been inaccurate or missing from different court settings. There should never be a report that doesn't match what happened in court. Also, one of the biggest concerns of all is safety. Not only is the circuit court clerk's office in charge of safety, and aside from the court shooting, but there has also been an unattended gun left by an officer in a bathroom in the building. I believe with collaboration of the sheriff's department, the district attorney, that we can make stronger bonds of security and we can also make a much stronger protocol for the courtroom. There should never be an officer, a judge, an attorney, or an audience member of the court that ever fears for their life in the court of law. I believe in strong communication. I believe in accurate records. And I also believe in the safety of our workers and the community. I believe that my experience, my education, will allow me to work with anyone from any background. I am purposeful with my actions. I am approachable and accessible at all times. I believe in the growth in this office, and I believe in growth in Coffee County. Thank you. Is a Democratic uh, candidate for Mayor David Pennington. Next is uh, incumbent and Republican candidate for Mayor Gary Cordell. After that, we have um, independent candidate for Mayor Tim Brown. He will not be on the ballot for the primary, but he will be on that for the general. Um, after that, we have Republican candidate for Mayor Mark Allen. And then uh, down at the end, we have Democratic candidate for Mayor John Constantine. We're going to allow two minutes for opening statements from everybody. After that, uh, we have several questions that we will go through. Each candidate will have two minutes to answer those questions, and we'll keep that on a timer and uh, let them know when their time is up. If um, we need to, to go back and forth a little bit if someone's addressed and we need to have a rebuttal for, for, an, for an answer, they will have one minute for that, okay? Um, but let's uh, start it off with uh, opening remarks and we'll go first with David Pennington. Hello everybody, my name is David Pennington and I am the Democratic candidate. I was born and raised in Tallahoma. In 1965, we moved to Manchester and uh, Bought the Jiffy Burger. There we go. All right. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> For 53 years, we've had the Jiffy Burger. And not only have we had the Jiffy Burger, we've had a trucking company, a warehousing company, storage trailer company, and a small rental company. Um, I was the mayor of this county for eight years. And uh, at the time, everybody knows the recession. So we went through some of the toughest times that you could um, uh, during this recession. So I'm asking you, as a candidate, to vote for me, David Pennington. All right, next will be Republican candidate, Gary Cordell. My name is Gary Cordell, and it is an honor to serve you as your current county mayor. The last four years have certainly been a learning experience. And uh, going into this, we made the commitment to, for eight years, that we would serve in uh, this office with honesty and integrity and make the right decisions for our taxpayers every day. It's been a learning experience. Just a second, Mayor. If you could just turn that microphone up towards you a little bit. Just okay. there, tilt it backwards just a little bit. There we go. All right. That's right. 
hope you hear me now. But it is an honor to serve you. And uh, we take our uh, every day as a new experience. We're learning all the time. We're trying to be the best uh, mayor that we can in this county. My goal is to, when, uh, when I finally go home and mission accomplished, to say that, that I've served with uh, honesty and integrity and the best, I've been the best mayor in Coffee County's history. Part of that, uh, and doing part of that is, as Mr. Mark Sona said a while ago, several of us have uh, really gone to a lot of classes that the University of Tennessee uh, uh, County Technical Assistance uh, Service it provides. And uh, with that in mind, we've, uh, we've worked hard to try to be, to learn all we can about this office and to be the best mayor we can. With that in mind, I've received also the uh, Certified Public Administrator Certificate and uh, as has the rest of deeds and Mr. Mark Sony. So we're trying to be the best public service we can for this county. My wife and I have lived in Hillsboro for uh, 33 years. We have a small farm there. We raised two sons and we have eight grandchildren. And uh, part of my purpose in being here today is to help uh, be the best mayor I can and create a positive foundation for our county to build on going forward. We've got to always keep in mind what is best for our young people in the next generation. And it's an honor to serve, and I'll have more comments in a few moments, but we're here to serve our people and make the right decision for our taxpayers every day, trying to keep our taxpayers low. But it's, it's an honor to serve you. I appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. I appreciate all of you being here. Thank you, uh, Mayor Cordell. Next will be independent candidate for mayor, Tim Brown. My name's Tim Brown. I was born and raised here in Coffee County all my life. I'm a 30 year veteran of the United States Army, retired. I'm running independent because I want to represent all the people of Coffee County. I have friends in both parties, and I want to work with Democrats, Republicans, and independents to do what's right for Coffee County. There's no room for partisan politics in the mayor's office. I would like to hope that all voters would vote based on the candidates' ideas instead of the letter beside their name. We've got a lot of good candidates. I'm not asking you to vote for me, just make the right choice. Thank you. All right, that was Tim Brown. Next, we have Republican candidate for mayor, Mark Allen. Hello, I'm, Mar I'm Mark Allen. Uh, I am, am, am a father, a husband, and a grandfather. Not a, not a politician. I've served 35 years as a public servant in various roles. Uh, an auditor with the state of Tennessee, Auditing County Governments, a finance director for the city, director of accounts and budgets for the county, and spent the last 10 years in an accounting firm uh, down in Tullahoma. Uh, currently, uh, I've chose to run for this office. There's one message that I want to give everybody. Please get out and vote. This is your county. Make sure, no matter who you vote for, make sure you vote. And if you want to make Coffee County accountable again, vote Mark Allen for Coffee County Mayor. All right, thank you. That was Mark Allen. And next we have Democratic candidate for mayor, John Constantine. I'm John Constantine. I'm 50 years old. Uh, married to a beautiful wife. have five beautiful children, two precious granddaughters, one a year and a half old, one just a month old. I uh, was born and raised in Rutherford County, but I started my first business in 1985 in Coffee County and have businesses here ever since probably best known for the LKQ facility located at the corner of 41 and Asbury Road. I started that company in 1996, uh, grew it rapidly, sold the company to uh, uh, LKQ, stayed on as a stockholder and worked with them to take the company public. So I learned a lot about how big businesses operate. Uh, the reason I'm running for mayor is for the last 12, 15 years, I've been very disappointed in the direction that the county has gone in, especially 
but when it pertains to taxation and debt. Uh, we have the third highest property tax rate in the state out of 95 counties, and I just don't agree with that. And I think that I'm the person that can put in place, you get, it's a simple fix. You either have to raise taxes or cut expenses, but you can do a, a mixture of both that's both good for the county and good for the taxpayer. And that's why I'm running for mayor. Thank you. All right, we want to move on to uh, the questions and how we're going to do this is uh, they have two minutes to answer each question. Uh, they do have one minute for rebuttals. And uh, we want to let you know, first of all, these questions have come submitted to Josh at the paper through you guys. Uh, we promoted on the radio, we've talked about it you know, a lot. We've also, you know, Josh has published a lot about this. So these questions came from you people of Coffee County. So we want to make sure that we, you know, announce that, that yes, it came from you and this is what people are thinking about in this election. So we go with our first question tonight. There is currently no signed operating contract between the county government and Bonnaroo. The previous contract offered a flat yearly payment of $30,000 and $3 per ticket sold and a payment of cost over uh, plus the uh, cost of overtime for uh, local emergency agencies. So the revenue from the ticket fee were placed into the general fund. The new contract proposed for Bonnaroo eliminates the $30,000 payment, increases ticket fees to $4 per ticket, but stipulates that the money just be placed in an infrastructure fund to use for improvements near the Great Stage Park. Do you believe this is a fair deal for the citizens of Coffee County? If not, do you have a plan that you would like to talk about this evening? Goes to David first. David first. Okay. <clears throat> um, the the rural infrastructure. I mean the the Bonnaroo Fund um, has. You're exactly right. Went into the general fund. It usually generates between. 225 and 250 but um, if you want Bonnaroo to stay here um, and let them use that four dollars and of course the the ticket sales the the patron pays the four dollars so that four dollars is invested back into infrastructure at Bonnaroo now what does that mean uh, there's a lot of real estate developers in here and they know that an empty field is not worth nothing like a field with water and sewer and cut up lots. That adds value to your property. And not only does it add value, it <laughs> adds more taxes. So I would negotiate a deal and let the, let the $4 go back into the rural infrastructure, I mean into the, into the Bonnaroo infrastructure, and you would eventually, from the from the uh, investment of the infrastructure, you'll eventually get that money back from other events. Now, you're gonna get some of that money back right off the top from the, uh, from the property tax. Um, but also, keep in mind that the rule last year got over $700,000 in um, sales tax from the tickets. 30 now, seconds. 30 seconds. Seven hundred thousand dollars in sales tax from the tickets sales. Um, I'm talking about ticket sales on the sales tax. The rule is the one that gets the extra seven hundred thousand, and that's the only time the rule ever has a big bump in their property taxes. It usually runs between two hundred and two hundred twenty-five thousand. This year it was nine hundred twenty-two thousand dollars. So if you back that off, it's about seven hundred thousand goes back into the rule. And where does that first seven hundred thousand dollars go? First half of that goes to the schools, and then the second half goes back into the rule. Uh, it's called CITES. It's where the where the money is uh, formed, whether it be Manchester or Tallahassee. Now, if you don't negotiate, that's time. If you want to wrap up what you're saying, that'll be fine. Okay. So if you don't negotiate some type of deal, you're going to lose a lot of revenue all the way around. Mayor Cordell, uh, do you need me to repeat the question? Or okay, 
Uh, currently, no signed operating contract between the county government and Bonnaroo. The previous contract offered a flat yearly payment of $30,000 plus $3 per ticket sold and payment of cost of overtime for personnel or local emergency services. The revenue from these ticket sales or ticket fees were placed into the general fund. The new contract proposed by Bonnaroo eliminates the $30,000 payment, increases ticket sales or ticket fees to $4 per ticket, but stipulates that that money be placed into an infrastructure fund to use on improvements to the Great Stage Park. Do you believe that this is a fair deal to the citizens of Coffee County? And if not, do you have a plan that you'd like to talk about? Lucky this has been a fair deal in the past. We are in intense discussions right now with Bonnaroo, and I know our budget finance uh, committee met this afternoon. Uh, that has generated over, uh, as Special said, over $234,000 a year on the ticket sales. Uh, that, that was put in place with the beginning of Bonnaroo 16 or 17 years ago. That contract did run out last June. We have talked with them and I've suggested in the past a year that you simply go ahead for this year, since we're in these discussions, and just simply continue the $3 that you were paying last year plus the thirty plus the $30,000. So we are in intense discussion with them. They are talking about other events. It is important that this county invest in our infrastructure. And it is important that we invest in infrastructure out there. Uh, they are working on other events. We yet to see any of those events. I know we've been in discussion uh, regarding the, the coming of the state fair to Coffee County. We are one of three or four counties that are in contention to that. I talked recently with the uh, Commissioner of Agriculture regarding that. And also, uh, two weeks ago, I guess it is, uh, the, uh, the president of the state fair board. I'm not that optimistic that that can uh, come about someday, but we're in discussion with them on that. Uh, that would bring a lot up in, to this county. That would be more than just a two-week event. They're guesstimating in the plan that they prepared about 120 or 30 days of activity at that site. So we are in discussion uh, regarding that. Uh, anyway, we, uh, we'll let you know on those uh, continuing discussions. And uh, I'm somewhat optimistic that they will come back and, and do the $3 this year, maybe the $4. So I just want to report that to you tonight. Thank you. Right, uh, Mr. Brown, do you need me to repeat it? No, sir. Okay. To me, it sounds like we're trying to hold Bonnaroo up. I don't know of any business in town that we require them to sign a contract for them to make money. We need to be better partners to Bonnaroo. Try not to run them off. We need, we need their revenue. Coffee County receives the local option sales tax when all the ticket sales sold, food, beverages, merchandise sold on the Bonnaroo grounds. Local option sales tax is 2.75% of all those sales. In 2017, that totaled over a million dollars. They also pay property taxes, the county collects vendor fees, and Bonnaroo uses local small businesses here in town for their site work and other needs. So we need to work with Bonnaroo and quit trying to run them off. That's the reason a lot of times we can't get other business in town because we try to rob them. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Allen, you need me to repeat? Okay. That'll be good. Okay. I'll do that. It is a mouthful. So. Yeah, it is. <laughs> there is currently no signed contract between the county government and Bonnaroo. The previous contract offered a flat yearly payment of $30,000 plus the $3 uh, per ticket sold and payment of cost of overtime and personnel for local emergency agencies. The revenue from these ticket fees were placed into the general fund. The new contract proposed by Bonnaroo eliminates the $30,000 payment, increases ticket fees to $4 per ticket, but stipulates that the money just be placed into the infrastructure fund to use for improvements at the Great Stage Park. Do you believe that this is a fair deal for the citizens of Coffee County? And if not, we'd like to hear your plan. I believe Bonnaroo should be treated as any other business of our county in an ethical manner with the same rights, privileges, and obligations of any other business of the county. We need to create a business-friendly environment to continue to grow Coffee County and make Coffee County what, it, what I know it can be or what I envision it to be. We need more and we need to, to cultivate 
a good business environment here. Negotiating a contract with the threat of a tax held over their head, such as an amusement tax, is unethical from a tax levying body. That's why I believe there should be no negotiations. Either levy a tax or don't, which I prefer don't, but they should pay their appropriate share of taxes. Thank you. Mr. Costin, do you need it repeated or? No, sir. Okay. All right, thank you. Well, I'm going to be on the opposite end of everybody up here on this discussion. I've spent uh, many, many, many hours on the internet looking at Live Nation concerts and what they pay in amusement taxes across this country, and we absolutely have the worst deal with any of them. They range anywhere from 5 to 10%. Nobody commits any infrastructure dollars like the $750,000 we just gave them to run a water line to their farm and the $5 million that they want now to run a road to their farm. Uh, David did mention development. I've been a developer. And when I developed my first subdivision in Coffee County, I bought the property. I had to hire an engineer to go out and, and subdivide the property. I had to get it approved through the commission. I had to extend water and sewer lines to that property. I had to build the lines, the water and sewer lines on that property to the city specs, build the road to the city specs, and then I had to donate that back to the city. So for them to feel like that they're being mistreated because we're not going to subsidize a $10 billion company by giving them $6.75 million of taxpayer money is absolutely absurd. Nobody else in the country does it. We're the only one that does it. They threaten to move. They threaten that they're going to, you know, or there are always these promises for 16 years. I've heard about the Christian Festival, the Country Festival, the, the Nashville Fair, the 80s Rock Festival. There's all these festivals that are going to come, but so far they produce nothing. And so when they actually have a contract and they want to produce, they want to come to us and say, hey, We'd like for y'all to invest so we can get the Nashville Fair. They're putting the cart ahead of the horse. They're saying, hey, let's spend your money to improve the, the, our property. And that's basically all it improves. And maybe we'll get somebody else in here to bring some revenue in. So I think that it needs to absolutely, the whole system needs to be changed. And it's always been one-sided in their favor. Thank all you. All right. With David's name being mentioned in Mr. Constantine's uh, uh, statement there, David, you will have one minute. Well, I still hold to what I say. Uh, Bonnaroo, if you put that infrastructure in uh, with the dollar sales of, of, the, of the ticket sales, you, you'll grow that back in other sales, but you're also gaining it back when that real estate is developed. You'll also gain some of it back from the value of the property. What is your stance on county and city officials receiving uh, a high volume of Bonnaroo tickets for free? Could that be construed as a bribe, a gift, influence on voting? What is your feeling on any of this? Doing some research on the look and that is a good question. Uh, over the years they have, even when they came here, they did have an understanding years ago that they would give tickets to the person that you mentioned. The I would mention that the mayor's office, I'll just mention this right up front, we have no vote in the contract per se. Uh, over the years, uh, 100 tickets have been given to the mayor's office and uh, as, as tickets. And the first 100 people that call in to put their name on a list, they're down for a ticket. So we don't handle the distribution of tickets. Uh, those actually go to uh, the names are turned in and they go by the uh, high school and pick those up. And uh, I would go ahead and mention that uh, if there's any question about a conflict on that, as maybe has been alluded to, uh, I've instructed Bonnaroo just to go ahead and cut out those one or tickets come to the mayor's office. That's been a tradition for 16 years, whatever, but to 
uh, remove any question about a conflict on that, I would instruct them to go ahead and, and not send those to the mayor's office. Now to the others, over the years they've had the ambassador program where the county employees are involved in that and they do send some to uh, city officials or whatever. But that's been an effort, a goodwill gesture to uh, the representatives of the county to get out and get involved and to be ambassadors for them to go out and look. Uh, for example, the, uh, the uh, commissioners over the years have been given two tickets. Uh, they have asked the commissioners to go out and walk over the grounds and give them feedback as to items they think that the areas that we're doing right in, we're doing good in, or areas that we can improve in. 30 seconds. Now, the, the commissioners obviously would not pay the price of a ticket to go out and do that, but that's been a goodwill gesture to the uh, commissioners and the uh, our, our uh, employees to do that. So uh, I stand with that and support that, but I have mentioned to them that they can go ahead and cut out the 100 tickets coming to the mayor's office just to remove any uh, concern about any uh, ethical conflict. Mr. Brown, you are next. I don't have a lot to say on that because I'm not in the mayor's office, but I think it's unethical because if they give the mayor 100 tickets, they're going to expect something in return whether you say so or not. They're going to be wanting favors and you're going to feel like you're obligated to them. And I have seen those tickets that the county gets in the hands of people selling them. So I, I would not accept them. Mr. Allen? It's a violation of the county ethics policy to accept gifts from anybody. They're in violation of their own ethics policy that could cause termination of a regular county employee. It's unethical to accept gifts and to be voting on something such as a road or infrastructure and water lines out at Bond Road. The perception of it is just as bad as the reality of it. Whether there's quid pro quo involved or not, the perception of that is, is bad and the tone of government is set at the top. So the people that are following the examples of our leaders, that would be unacceptable behavior for, for our county employees. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Costain, you need to repeat? No. Okay. Um, under my administration, there will absolutely be no free tickets to anybody, any public official, or any county employee. It may be legal. I don't know. I haven't checked that. But everybody in this room knows what's right and what's wrong. And if somebody lays $3,000 worth of tickets down in front of you for free, they might as well lay $3,000 in cash down in front of you for free. And then they come to you and they ask you to vote on things that they need. And right's right and wrong's wrong and giving those free tickets to people that make decisions about how we handle their contract and their infrastructure request is just flat wrong. Mr. Pennington. Okay, let me straighten up something. First of all, no, no office uh, gets a ticket. All you do is get an opportunity, a list, to put a name on the list as an ambassador uh, from the county to Bonnaroo. And how we did it as mayor, and I think the mayor over here does it the same way, we did the first come, first serve basis. We have 100 names, not tickets. And we let them, started May the 1st, first come, first serve. And to qualify for that, you agree, it even says there's a contract, basically, that if you take this ticket, I mean this name, and they give you the right to come to Bonnaroo, which they do give you an armband afterwards, if they choose, I have had some on the list that they, they did not even let. I mean, some they did and some they didn't. They didn't let the whole hundred sometimes. But if you choose to do that, you agree that if they contact you, that you'll fill out a survey. And it's not just the mayor's office. Um, we were actually the funnel for the whole group. So we funneled all the names through the mayor's office 
four runners so you'd have one centralized location and then we turned the names in, into Bonnaroo. So it was all names, not tickets. And like I said, it's an, it, it was an ambassador. You, you were an ambassador and you might get an uh, armband and you might not. It's not guaranteed. Okay? Joshua. All right, I think uh, Tim Brown will take this next question first. With the current fiscal year nearing an end, and the Manchester Coffee County Conference Center projected to lose $330,000 for the year. That will put the center's losses nearing $900,000 over the past two years. The average taxpayer appears to be losing patience with this. How do you propose minimizing losses for the conference center and bringing that situation under better fiscal control? Well, I'm glad you asked that because a lot of people's interested in the conference center. This is an issue that taxpayers feel strongly about. The public board authority, which Mayor Cordell and Mr. Pennington's own, have been very, very patient with this. They've done absolutely nothing. Enough's enough. In the last two years of operating losses, the conference center's lost almost $1 million. And what have we done? Nothing. We've done nothing. Manchester Coffee County split the cost on the conference center. It's supposed to be 50-50. It's built in 2002. $3.5 million project. We are still paying those bonds today. From 2002 to 2017, the operating losses on the conference center is $2.3 million. It's, it's out of control. Losses this year will be close to $400,000. Should have never been built. The burden's on us, the taxpayers. We, we're paying for this loss. Last year, the losses were close to $500,000. Something must be done about this soon. We've got to do something. We can't keep losing money. Small businesses in town, we don't get, they don't get bailouts like the conference center. We don't go pay them money to keep operating. If I had a business that's lost a million dollars in the last two years, I'd close the doors down or sell it. Taxpayers have had enough, and the issue needs to be addressed. And like I said, we've done absolutely nothing to fix it. The oversight is supposed to be done by the Public Building Authority. They have not done their jobs. The last three years, 2015, over $300,000 lost. 2016, over $400,000. 2017, over $500,000 lost. Gone in the wrong direction. And we have nothing to show for it. We need, we need to close the doors, sell the place, or get somebody there to manage the place that will do it right. Thank All right, that's time. I'm going to let that come back to this end before we go down the table. I think uh, Mr. Brown uh, addressed uh, David and uh, Gary. Uh, 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 well, I'll tell you, why don't you go first? One minute. No, I'll tell you what. Let the mayor go and just keep going down the line. And All right. Just to me. But the mayor does have, he is not on the board, and I'll let him say that. I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll come back down to this side. We'll give you guys three minutes okay. so we keep it in order. Let's go down to uh, Mark Allen. Do uh, you need the question again? <clears throat> the conference center should be run as a business. The original projections for the losses at the conference center, including the debt service payments, were only $60,000 a year for 20 years. It is mismanagement at its best. Now, we've got to get it under control. I have the experience to get that under control. We're going to have to set a limit Every year there's a budget amendment for the increased losses out there. And when they're discussing losses, they're just talking about the operating losses. The original pro forma financial statements that were prepared in the original study called for both the debt service and the operating losses not to exceed $60,000. That's what the city of Manchester agreed to. That's what the county agreed to. 
Now they're ten times that. Action has to be taken. Thank you. All right. That was uh, Mark Allen. Next is John Constantine. John, do you need me to repeat the question? No, sir. Uh, definition of insanity. Doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting a different outcome. We have poured millions of dollars into that conference center and it has been a failed experiment. And it should have been closed down a long time ago. My proposal is to try to find a private entity that would come in and take it over and let them try to run it at break even or for a profit. And if we can't find that person, it needs to be shut down and sold. It's time to stop the bleeding. Six million dollars in total losses to the Coffee County taxpayers, that's more than enough. Thank you. That was, that was John Constantine. We'll bring it back down to the this end of the table, and uh, Mr. Pennington will give you three minutes here uh, to address this question. Okay, so a couple years ago, I was asked to be put on that board. They asked me to come, and I did agree to do that. And and we have slowly, we are stopping the bleeding, and we are turning around. But let let me, let me say something about the the PBA board. How's it made up? You've got uh, two bankers, two engineers, a retired colonel, and two business people on that board. I think every one of them that on that board are very successful people. And um, yes, it does lose money. But there is a motel tax that the city of Manchester gets. And in the agreement, the agreement was that if, if Manchester uh, to get the motel tax, they agreed not to annex the industrial park so that they could market the industrial park as a one tax, one tax park, which has turned out to be a good thing. And not only have they done that, also when that building is paid for in three years, I know the county has put a lot of money in it, but the county is going to end up with the building. The building goes to the county. So, so, so Manchester has benefited from the the motel tax but also the county is going to end up with a building that's going to have a high marketed, marketable value. But also, let's, let's think about the sales tax here too. The first half of the sales tax always goes to the schools. And there's a lot of sales tax generated because of the conference center. And where did Tallahoma have their chamber um, get together in this community? If they had it at the conference center, why? Because there's no place in this community that you can have a large event. And yes, it does cost. But in the long run, the county will get their money back through the building. The, the Manchester has got their, they're getting their money back through the motel. The school system gets the sales tax. And so, at some time, and let me just say this, Rebecca French is the manager out there. And she was through in the middle of, of where the uh, the employee that was managing it, and and I got when I was put on the board, she'd already been hired, and and I'm going to take responsibility because I'm on the board. I'm not just I'm not saying I am responsible because I agreed to be on the board, so I'm going to take responsibility. But that lady embezzled a lot of money uh, from the conference center, and she used our um, our maintenance money for our equipment repair. She used that to keep the, the conference center going. So, yes, it has lost a lot of money, but there's a lot of value to that. And like I said, Rebecca French is young, and she's done a very good job. She, she works hard out there, and we are turning it around. And we do have responsible PBA board members. And if they want to do something different, there's seven people on that board. So. Uh, you, you talk to them if, if, if you have that issue. And you can, you can get their names from the mayor's office. All right, that was David Pennington. And next we have Mayor Cordell. Uh, mayor, do you need me to repeat that question, please? All right. With the current fiscal year nearing an end in the Manchester Coffee County Conference Center projected to lose $330,000 for the year, 
That will put the center's losses nearing $900,000 over the past two years. The average taxpayer appears to be losing patience with this practice. How do you propose minimizing losses for the conference center and bringing that situation under better fiscal control? Three minutes. Let me mention, Josh, that the oversight of that is under the Public Building Authority Board, as it mentioned. When I came into this office uh, almost four years ago, right off the bat we started structuring that and looking at that. I was, with what I heard and what came forward, I was somewhat concerned about the future of this, and right off the bat uh, we talked about looking at selling the structure and trying to minimize our losses and get out of it. But when you get into the contract that was laid out years ago, that is a mutual agreement between the city of Manchester and the county in which we're locked in for we're locked in for those full 20 years. We do owe this year's payment and three more years on that. It will be paid off in 2021. Now, according to the research that our county attorney did on that, the quit claim deed quit claims that to the public building authority, not to the county or Manchester City. But that stays that goes for the public building authority. Over the years, we've looked at. Uh, different uh, provisions on changing some things out there. Again, the structure of that, the oversight is not with the mayor's office at all, but it rests in the public building authority, as the former mayor here said. But a lot of things have been looked at, and uh, to sell that, though, you have to have a mutual agreement between Manchester City and the county, and I don't see that happening anytime soon. I did go before a Manchester and suggest, after thinking about that, and we looked at different options, I know it's been Every year, it's heavily vetted through our budget and finance committee. They look at the, the oversight of that, and every year, they make a decision as to how much the county will put in this year. As has been stated, it does bring other revenue to, the, uh, to this area, but Manchester City will get the uh, hotel and uh, motel tax from that by law, and get the sales tax. So the county is, is not getting uh, that portion. So I did recommend to Manchester City back last fall that you think about changing that percentage split to equalize this uh, and go 70-30 because you're getting some share of hotel and motel tax and sales tax that's coming into Manchester City, not to the county. So it's a very complex and complicated, uh, complicated situation, but by, uh, by agreement, by contract, as it was set up years ago in 02, uh, the ownership of that is, or the, uh, that split uh, for 20 years, the mortgage payment, and the losses between Manchester City and, and the county. Very complicated situation. Again, budget finance has looked at that numerous times as to how going forward to try to minimize that loss and the cost of the county taxpayer. But it's, it's a complicated situation. All right, thank you. That was Gary Cordell. And uh, Lucky will have the uh, next question. Thanks, Josh. Uh, Mr. Allen, this question is for you. What experience do you have to justify overseeing a uh, multi-million dollar county budget? I have 35 years experience. I'm a certified public accountant. Uh, I graduated from UTC with honors in accounting. Uh, I've worked uh, on numerous budgets across the state of Tennessee providing assistance in preparation for counties, uh, working with County Audit. Uh, I was finance director for the city of Manchester, a director of accounts and budgets for Coffee County. Uh, today, we're providing assistance to three cities, budget preparation and financial statement preparation on a monthly basis at my office. Uh, extreme experience in, in budget budgeting and accounting and financial statements preparation uh, it's been my life work it's been my love providing public service for y'all through budgets and financial statements thank you Mr. Costey. well I've actually personally managed uh, in my own company a budget larger than the Coffee County budget currently is. I've worked with companies like Deloitte & Touche, uh, which are large auditing companies. I've worked with uh, budgets that I would get in monthly 
stacked that high with print so small that you couldn't read them. Uh, I'm extremely good at going through a budget and finding what I call the fat and or mistakes that are made there. Um, I'm extremely comfortable. I've managed hundreds of employees at a time. I'm extremely comfortable managing large amounts of money. And I don't think that I would have any problem. As a matter of fact, if you go to the controller's office, um, the state of Tennessee, all the county budgets are there. They're posted there, and I've reviewed every one of them. And that's where I've came up with some of the insight that I have in the changes that I want to make to the county. Thank you. Thank you, sir. David? Okay. So I have eight years as been the county mayor, but also we have one of the best budget uh, directors that I've ever seen. Mariana Edinger is a sharper budget director that I've ever seen. And also, uh, I have managed and been in partnership with multi-million dollar warehouse firm and a trucking company like I told you before. Um, so, there's where my experience comes from. Gary Cordell. Served as your mayor, it's again an honor. But it's a learning experience, and we've learned a lot. As the former mayor said, Miss Edinger is one of the sharpest accounts in this state. She runs a very tight ship. She's on top of her game. She and I talk uh, almost daily about the budget. We are in the process now of, of uh, coming forward and submitting to budget finance the proposed budget for this year. I went through those uh, departments last, last week, line to line, department by department and made some tweaks on some of those that I have oversight over. But uh, it's a very complicated process. We do have, now unlike what our, uh, the other mayors may think, when you come in as mayor, you don't have the authority to go in and say, we're gonna cut this, that, or whatever. In the state of Tennessee, uh, with the system was set up in 1978, with 10 constitutional elected offices, each of those departments have the authority to prepare their own budget. The mayor cannot come in and just simply go in and say, we're going to cut your budget. We don't have the, we don't have the law. We can't, we can't do that. Uh, that's illegal. But as far as oversight of the county, we do have an extremely good budget finance department. Uh, Mr. Bricken, who is the chair of that and has been for years, is also a CPA and uh, has been the former CEO of a bank. And I would mention that uh, uh, at UTC, I also graduated from there and had a degree in business administration with a minor in accounting and economics. And I spent several years at uh, Blue Cross in Chattanooga in the budget finance department preparing budgets there. So I have some experience in that. But I tried to review every budget and every line. And we, we're going to have some uh, cuts that need to be made in a couple areas in this, this year's budget for sure. Some serious cuts so that we can manage that and have a, uh, a, a budget without a tax increase. Uh, we've gone three years now with a tax in, without a tax increase. We should not have one this year and pay down on our debt about 11%. But that takes financial oversight and management, and uh, you have to make some tough, tough, tough calls. And, uh, but it's an honor to serve and try to do that. But uh, we have a good budget finance committee, and uh, I assure you, they go through with a fine tooth comb vetting every budget. And there's not the fat there that a lot of people may think there is. The fat is not there. About 8% of the cost of every budget is uh, wages, and benefits. So uh, some of those budgets this year coming in at maybe 1% over last year or 2%, so we're trying to run a very fine, sharp operation in account and budget. Mr. Brown, do you need it repeated? No, sir. Okay. In 2006, during Hurricane Katrina, the United States Army Corps of Engineers hired me, sent me to New Orleans to oversee the rebuild of the hospital and the school. They gave me $16 million. The way I managed the money down there, I worked strictly with the contractors. I overseen them. I watched them every day. I then daily reports and weekly reports turned into the Corps of Engineers. And when the project was finished, I spent $11 million. So I had $5 million left over. Thank you. All right. That was uh, Tim Brown. I believe we're ready for our next question. And I think John Constantine gets this one first. A lot of talk in that last round about debt. So. Conveniently, that's where we're headed uh, for our next question. The county debt is uh, currently at approximately $80 million. A lot of that tied up in your newly constructed 
uh, building fund, your jail, uh, things like that. Right now, the county school system requesting, or about to request, about $25 million uh, for more upgrades to their school system, and the jail already is at full capacity. How do you propose funding these needs while minimizing the impact on property taxes and the taxpayer? Well, you mentioned the jail, and um, I propose that we actually audit our judicial system from the top to the bottom. Uh, it's a little outdated. Uh, if you look, if you go to TennesseeDepartmentOfCorrections.com, the sheriff of every county submits a report, talks about uh, the number of beds available, how many of them are full, how many of them are pretrial felonies, misdemeanors, convictions, how many of them are TDOC people that were getting reimbursed for housing. And Coffee County has the highest rate of pre-trial misdemeanor offenders in the state. We have more people sitting in jail for minor offenses than Davidson County, Shelby County, which includes Memphis, Rutherford County. Um, and so my first proposal would be to change the way we treat minor offenders. One way to do that is you write them a summons instead of taking them to jail, booking them in jail, and setting a bond that they can't afford to get out. Uh, the other thing you do is you actually update your bonding system. Uh, right now, you know, it's this crime, it's $2,500. But it doesn't take into consideration is, have you lived in this county for 40 years? Do you have a job? Are you married? Or are you from Florida? They get the same bond either way. So we spend two and a half million dollars a year out of the jail housing pre-trial misdemeanor offenders that are people that should be out and working and taking care of their families instead of increasing that burden even more on taxpayers. And then we can bring in more Tennessee Department of Corrections um, inmates that we get reimbursed for to help offset the cost of the new jail. Um, so that's one of the big things that I, I, I see that's going to make a big change. Um, and then once you get that money, you save that money, then you reallocate it. And they keep saying, I keep hearing it's complicated, it's complicated, but it's really not that complicated. And so if you increase your revenue from Bonnaroo for a million and a half dollars and you cut two and a half million dollars worth of expenses out of the jail, that's four million dollars and you shut down the conference center, all of a sudden we've got four and a half million dollars a year that we can do different things with. We can concentrate on school safety, seconds. school safety programs and and trying to fulfill the needs of our students by these expansions that we need to make and get our kids out of portals. Thank you. All right, that was John Constantine. Before we bring it back down here to uh, David Pennington for our uh, radio audience, we have to take a quick break. Uh, for some technical issues. We'll be back in about just one minute, so everybody just stay where you're Back to uh, David Pennington. Same question. The county debt right now is approximately at $80 million. Much of this tied up in newly constructed jail and the county schools building fund. The county school system has approached the uh, county commission of budget and finance about the $25 million project uh, for improvements to the school and uh, necessary upgrades and the jail currently is uh, near or at full capacity for what it was built for. Uh, how do you propose uh, funding some of these needs while minimizing the impact on property tax rates and the citizens of Coffee County? Okay, so really to, as of today the debt is not 80 million, it's 71 million. And six, My fault, sorry. Okay. 71 million. Okay, and 67 million of that is the jail and schools, okay? And so how, how could we manage that? I'll tell you how we managed it, same way you did when I was mayor when there was 180 people in jail. We went to the district attorney, we went to the judges, we went to the probation department, and we worked out a deal where they wouldn't put people in jail just for, for not paying their child support, give them a chance to, to get caught up and, and, and deal with it that way. And we, we managed from the time I was mayor until we built a new jail, we managed to do that with the help of the DA, the help of the judges, the help of, of uh, Heather, and the uh, probation. That's how you do it. You work as a team. 
not to put people in jail if you can. And that's how you save your money. And on the schools, right now they have, they have a, the way I understand it, I'm, I'm not the mayor now and I hadn't been up to the budget and finance meetings, but the way I understand it, they're going to have some rural, uh, rural money, rural infrastructure money coming out uh, and they're going to have some stuff paid for. So they're going to be able to do about $10 million without raising property taxes. And that's the way you need to do it. And, and they're going to do, I think, New Union and North Coffee. Is that right, Mayor? So that's how you handle that. All right. Thank you, David Pennington. Uh, same question to Mayor Cordell. Mayor, do you need it repeated? No. All right, go ahead. As I just mentioned, the former mayor, yes, we have the school system has proposed uh, a long-term program in two phases, totaling about $25 million. We've looked at the first two schools uh, being about $5 million for uh, North Coffee and 5 for New Union. And uh, yes, we have already done a crunch of figures on that. And we can do that with no tax increase, the way we're funding that, over the next 20 years. Okay, and that's critically important. Now, we're, the reason we're doing those two schools first uh, is with the growth coming out of Rutherford County, we've got to gear up for that. North Coffee currently will have, has about 320 students, but with the upgrades there, that will uh, be uh, hold about 500 students. Going forward, as it relates to the jail budget and whatever, one thing I did find out and doing some research, and I have requested uh, CTAS, the County Technical Assistance Service, to do a full-scale audit and review of the entire jail program probation, all the sentencing, the way that we're assessing the bonds, and uh, whatever, the whole nine yards to come back to see what we do better. I do know that uh, the uh, incarceration rate in Coffee County has been since 2002 per thousand people, well over four people per thousand people. Uh, in the study nationally, uh, nationwide, that figure is only about two million, uh, excuse me, two point, uh, about two and a quarter of people per one, uh, 1,000 people. So the rate in Coffee County for many years has been almost double the national average, as he indicated a while ago. Now, as far as how to structure some of this and go forward, uh, I haven't talked with the sheriff on this. I wanted to today, sheriff, but never got to meet with you. Reviewing that budget, and I've already discussed this with the, uh, our, our budget director, with the massive increase that we have this year coming in from some departments, and with the, with the increase in the uh, jail budget for the annex, I have talked with two or three of the Budget Finance Committee members already suggesting we look at July 1 just completely closing the annex. And with that, that would save the county right at 500000 doing that. That will transfer them back to the, uh, to the uh, main jail, but that will save about 500000 And we're also looking at redoing the, the bonds. Uh, that's three notes, three bonds, nine, nine, and four million. And the state of Tennessee says you never finance and infrastructure longer than it's estimated useful life. The state has talked to them, they've already said that you know, it won't last that long. We've already reworked nine million, and the way we're doing that, cutting that down to 25 years, paying another $100,000 per year, that will save our taxpayers about three million in doing that one step. So we're trying to save your tax dollars all, every day. All right, thank you, Mayor Cordell. And uh, next will be Tim Brown. Tim, do you need the question repeated? No, sir. The debt is better today than it was in the prior administration, but we need to do more. Every dollar waste is a dollar that we could be used to pay down on the county's debt. Last year, just the interest on the county's debt was $3.2 million. That $3.2 million could be used somewhere else or left in the taxpayers' pockets. We need to stop the waste, stop the overspending, and start generating more business revenue. Overspending, overborrowing is not enough revenue. There's not enough revenue coming in for this. It's a mess. After David Pennington's eight years as mayor, Coffee County had $8 million in debt, which is, like he said, it's not his fault. A school and a jail. Had to have it. Four years later, the total debt is $74 million, $71, 74 But we haven't fixed the spending, the borrowing, or increased the revenue enough. Last year, the interest on the, the county debt, like I said, was $3.2 million, and that's just the interest. Stop the wasteful spending. Look for ways to be more efficient, borrow as little as we can, and only if we have, well, <clears throat> only if we have it, only if we have to, only borrow if we have to, and make those changes to get businesses to come into Coffee County. All right, that was Tim Brown. And uh, last, uh, we have Mark Allen on this question. Do you need to repeat it? No, I think I've got this one. <laughs> <laughs> 
We have issued in the past massive amounts of debt that exceed the life of the assets. In the mid-90s, we went through a renovation program of our schools here. Those renovations are at the end of their life. So I'm, I, but I'm not going to address the needs of that now. I will address one thing. Public safety of our children come first. We have other needs we need to address right now before the renovations of a school. We've got needs at our high school to get that school secured. That comes first. Public safety of our children especially comes before the needs of North Coffee maybe being out a little bit of space or needing some, some additional cafeteria space. I hate to stress that. The, I went to a class and listen to, to the Officer Ray speak. In the response time that we have now, 12 children get shot before we can get an officer there. We need to harden our schools and get security on our schools first before we address any further spending. We need to take care of our county employees these public servants are dedicated. They've hung with us through thick and thin and been overlooked for years. It's time to bring it up. We've got to do something about our most valuable asset first. We've got to come up with a focused spending plan. We've got a plan for these buildings and these renovations in the future. And I'm the person that can give us that plan. With my experience, we have to have one. We have to know what the needs are going to be in the future, or we're not going to be able to meet the needs for our children and grandchildren. The jail will be, we'll be building a new jail before that one's paid off. About 10 seconds. We'll be building new schools before these are paid off. Thank you. All right. That was Mark Allen. I think we've gotten to everybody on this question. Um, we're pushed up against our time, but we're still gonna we're gonna run this one over just a little bit and uh, give everybody one minute for closing remarks. And we'll start uh, with David Pennington. Okay, since I've been retired as county mayor, there's two things that people tell me they want. They want more good paying jobs and they want more retail. Um, why I was mayor with the help of one of the best industrial boards in the state to two cities and a good commission, we were able to recruit $240.6 million worth of industrial development. And that's only in buildings and equipment. And we generated 2,968 good paying industrial jobs. Now folks, when you get that kind of investment in your community, retail will follow the money. And so if elected again, I'm gonna strive to work on more, more jobs and more retail. All right, thank you. That was David Pennington, and next uh, one minute for Mayor Gary Cordett. Thank you again. It's been a, it's an honor to serve the people of our county. At the end of the day, the most basic question you need to ask yourself is, going forward, when I step into the voting booth, who is best qualified to lead this county? We can talk about other issues and whatever all day long, but who is best qualified? I would submit to you that with 30 plus years of uh, business management and leadership experience, I can help move Coffee County forward. We are looking at other jobs, other businesses coming in. That's a very, again, a very complicated uh, 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 process. <coughs> Having said that though, I just want to ask you this question. Uh, with the uh, four, uh, past four years of the, of the experience, and education I've gained and getting the uh, certificate that I mentioned to you, I feel I'm the best qualified person to move our county forward. A lot has been accomplished. A lot of groundwork has been laid, but there's a lot of work to still be done. Our theme is let's stay on track. And I ask for your support in moving the county forward, and uh, thank you for your support. All right.
That was Mayor Gary Cordell. Next we have Tim Brown, one minute. Coffee County is not a, a very business friendly county. We need to look at our zoning, our plan, and then fix the problems. We had, we've had complaints and lost businesses here in the future. We need to fix this. Love Truck Stop, everybody's heard about Love Truck Stop. They fought with the county for eight months to try to come into Coffee County. They finally won, but they're gonna bring $20 million investment to our county, 40 full paying jobs, property taxes, sales taxes, business taxes, so we, we desperately need them. Bonnaroo, we need to better, be a better partner with them and try not to run them off. We need their revenue. Wright Paving Company's been trying to come into the town for years. Over the past 14 years, they've uh, spent $10 million in the county doing jobs. If they're trying to open a quarry up in Hillsboro, if they open up, it's going to have 15 jobs, property taxes, sales taxes, and severance taxes. So we, we need their business. I mean, a lot of people don't like it, but we've got to grow. We need the tax dollars. All right, that was Tim Brown. And next we have Mark Allen. We need a change of direction. We need to take action. We've got many issues facing this county into the future. We've got deep debt that we have to meet those needs. We have all kinds of issues. We've got conference centers losing money. We've got to take action. Now's the time to take action. Four more years from now, the situation is going to be worse. We need to be focused with a vision for Coffee County and grow the county, become more business friendly, and grow the county and grow out of our situation. Thank you. All right, that was Mark Allen. And uh, last we have John Constantine. One minute. I want to remind everybody, we're all up here today, but it's actually David Pennington and I are running on a, a Democratic ticket. And I want to, uh, David has a tremendous advantage on me. Everybody in Coffee County knows David. He's got name recognition. I've known him for 35 years. I ate his restaurant for thousands, probably thousands of times, as you can tell. <laughs> um, but we have a very different vision. Uh, where this county needs to go. David also has an eight-year track record than when he was the mayor before. And that include, included six property or tax rate prop, tax hikes, one of them the largest property tax hike in the history of the county, quadruple our debt from $20 million to $80 million a year, and tried to pass a will tax. And I'm not for any of that. I think that we have got to sharpen our pencil cut down our debt, put money back in your pockets, because we take way too much money out of individuals' pockets and spend it on things that they don't need to be spent on. Thank you. All right, that was John Constantine, and he did bring up a good point. I want everybody to understand, we decided to bring all of the candidates up. They're gonna be split up in these primaries that are coming up uh, next month. David Pennington and John Constantine will be in the Democratic primary, if you vote uh, in the Democratic primary in May, uh, Mayor Cordell and Mark Allen will be on the Republican primary. If so, if you're voting in the Republican primary, you'll be choosing one of those. And Tim Brown will not be on ballot in the primary. He's running as an independent, so you'll see him on the ballot um, in August. Uh, with that, we'd like to thank uh, our mayor's candidates for coming out tonight and for their participation and their willingness to run. So first we're going to do the county clerk and speaking as incumbent, Teresa McFadden. Good evening. I am Teresa McFadden, your county clerk. I have served the people of Coffee County for almost 24 years. Prior to that, I was deputy clerk in the office where I learned the ropes and, and started to become acquainted with the people and their needs. And over the past 24 years, I have put to work the lessons I've learned. I believe I have done a good job for the people of the county. I think my record in that regard speaks for itself. 
Under my watch, we have relocated from a cramped office at the old courthouse building where the people stood on the other side of a glass wall to a modern and spacious computerized office that is designed to provide a welcoming, up-close experience between my deputies and the people we serve. I have maintained an open door for those who have issues they wish to discuss with me personally. For me, the work I've done for the county has always been personal. I did not get into this because of politics or because someone needed a name on the ballot. I got into it because I wanted to help my fellow citizens. I am a lifetime resident of Coffee County. I know many people in the county on a personal level. We have grown up together, gone to school together, rubbed elbows in the local markets, and gone to church together. We are friends. I have always approached my job as a facilitator to help my friends, all the citizens of Coffee County, understand and comply with the laws we are required to follow and that I am required to administer. I have served as the president of the County Clerks Association, been elected County Clerk of the Year, and am a certified public administrator. I consider it an honor that my fellow state clerks recognize the job I'm doing here in Coffee County. I attend meetings offered by the state to keep abreast of the latest changes to the laws and methods of administering those laws and often cover matters beyond the scope of my daily duties. But I attend because I believe they present another opportunity for me to provide the citizens of Coffee County with the best I can offer. I am blessed with a great group of employees that are devoted to the citizens, to the needs of the citizens. They complete transactions in an efficient and timely manner while keeping accuracy a top priority. Not only has my staff served you in a professional manner, but also many of you have gotten to know them as friends over the years. This helps the bridge the gap in making compliance with what could be daunting government regulation a less threatening and much more personable. I am running for the office again, and I asked you to support me in getting the word out and by voting me in for another term so that I may continue to provide the county with friendly, efficient, professional, and excellent service you have come to know. Thank you. Okay, our next candidate for county clerk is Jenna Hallmarker. Good evening. My name is Jenna Almacher. I'm running for county clerk. I'm going to go off the cuff just a little bit here um, in response to a little bit of what Teresa said. Um, I heard a lot of eyes, my's, and friends. I want to be we, us, and ours. Rather new to the political climate, I have an opportunity not only to craft my platform and tell you why you should vote for me, but to demonstrate, more importantly, my humanity. Like every politician, I could begin this evening by attempting to grandstand my education, prattle on about my ingenious rhetorical skills, dazzle you with my ability to regurgitate all of the Tennessee Code annotated and Supreme Court case law, even applicable to this clerkship. Perhaps even throw in a few eye winks, emphatic hand gestures, and, you know, the standard rehearsed political schmoozing. But as I was writing the speech, I realized I was beginning to sound like that which I have immense disdain for, the career politician. And I am here to tell you I am not a career politician. I am everything but a career politician. I am a veteran teacher, a lawyer, a single mother, a daughter, a real estate agent, a constitutionalist, an avid scholar, a voter, a concerned citizen, a rural mail carrier, a taxpayer, and an investor. I am you, all of you. And running for county clerk is the equivalent of putting stock into one of my greatest investments, this community. You know, my dad said to me yesterday, Jenna, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. As a 2004 honors graduate of Tullahoma High School and a current resident here of Manchester, I am vested. I want to give back to this community that cultivated my talents. 
I want to represent your interests and capitalize on the value of my diverse skill set in a way that will benefit all of you. Not just those in need of a marriage license, not just those in need of a new car tag, and not to cater to those simply because of their social status or bankroll. I want to increase the total market value of this county for everyone. How am I going to do that just as county clerk? Well, as the official records keeper, I will digitally streamline services and information, making our area more accessible and attractive to virtual onlookers. By revamping our technology in the office, we can make our community more compelling to prospective entrepreneurs and industrial suitors. By creating a rolling directory, an electronic business index, while perhaps offering web page links for goods and services, we can promote business and trading for all. I believe the way out of that deficit is increasing the capital market value of this county. And I can help you do that. By electing me, you will fundamentally be boosting the bottom dollar of your county. A little bit about my education, real short and sweet. I do have a JD from Nashville School of Law. Um, graduated in 2015, got my undergrad at MTSU, uh, BA in political science with minors in secondary education, economics, and sociology. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others, and to give his life as a ransom for many. In every aspect of my life, I submit to you, I am a servant, a humble one at that. Speeches can be rehearsed, handshakes and smiles can be faked, the status quo can be conserved, but character, character is evident through our service to others. I am asking you to place your faith and invest in me and with me. Elect Jenna Almacher for County Clerk. Our first one to hear from tonight is incumbent Donna Tony. Good evening, everyone. Hello, I'm Donna Tony, Coffee County Register of Deeds. I am running for re-election. My family has lived in Coffee County for several generations, and I was born here. My father was in the Navy, and at his retirement, we returned to the place we all knew as home. I, I have lived and worked in Coffee County for 37 years. 35 of those years were spent working in banking and in real estate, areas vital to be a successful Register of Deeds. I was elected your register in August 2014. I was the candidate with a resume to do the job. After becoming the Coffee County Register, I earned the designation of Certified Public Administrator from the University of Tennessee. I have had many years of experience utilizing the resources of the Register's Office. I have prepared, compiled, reviewed, and reviewed and have recorded many of the types of documents for which now I am responsible for. I have had experience working with and for the same entities that use the register services every day. And citizens as you, who depend on a knowledgeable, experienced register. The register you choose in this election will be responsible for not only recording, maintaining records of land deeds and mortgages, but also for more than a hundred different types of documents. And these documents are some of the most important legal documents that exist today. And of these documents, none are as vital to our well-being as those of real property ownership. The Register's Office has the sole responsibility and is the single depository for all these hundred documents. Please know that this is not a learn-as-you-go responsibility and that the next Register of Deeds you elect should be someone who has the education experience to serve the needs of the citizens of Coffee County. All the citizens of Coffee County deserve only the best candidate. I would like to tell you some of the accomplishments the staff and I have completed placing the office in the top of the state, corrected all previous state comptroller findings, secured the office military records, back indexed more than six previous years, 
implant, imp, implemented a new website, user-friendly, offering the price calculator and fraud alert. Purchased the first large plat scanner copier in the register's office. About 20 to, seconds. To digitalize the plats. Okay, um, I have to skip over. Folks, this is not a popularity contest. It is a Tennessee state constitutional official office. With now over 35 years of combined experience in the last three and a half years as your register, I will not need on the job training as a taxpayer's, at the taxpayer's expense. I am qualified to continue as your register of deeds. I will continue to serve the citizens of Coffee County from day one. I ask that you please vote for me, Donna Robinson Tony, a candidate on the Republican ballot in the primary. Thank you to all, Donna Robinson Tony. Okay, the next candidate will be Register of Deeds again. Here from Chris Elam. Good evening, everyone. First, a special thank you to Manchester Times and Thunder Radio for hosting such an important event for our county. As well as to each of you in attendance tonight, whether you are here in person or tuning in online or the radio. I am Chris Elam and I stand before you this evening, an individual who is committed to serving the people of Coffee County, eager to continue that service as your next Coffee County Restaurant of Deeds. My experience as a public servant stem from having the honor of serving the people of Manchester as an alderman, leading a nonprofit organization, as well as a sales team in the automotive industry and operating a small business. Coffee County has been my home my whole life, with the exception of when I was off at Holmes Community College and the University of West Georgia playing football and coaching. My wife, Kristen Lovelady Elam, who is a local family nurse practitioner, and I have two children. Cooper, three years old. Sawyer, one year old. Chris and I are proud to be products of our great county and now able to raise a family here. My fuel from serving others originates from leading a nonprofit organization, the Dust Elam Foundation. That was established to help others in need. It was established when my brother was tragically killed 14 years ago. It has grown into a strong and respected outlet that serves the underprivileged and special needs children in our county. The experiences at hand have taught me a great deal about the importance of working together along with strong and effective leadership in order to meet the needs of the great people of Coffee County. If elected, I will use my skills and experiences to ensure Coffee County Register Deeds Office is led as a customer focused, efficient, and progressive place people of Coffee County can be proud of. With a proven record of public service to the people of Coffee County, I would be honored and proud to have your vote to elect me, Chris Elam, as your next Coffee County's Register Deeds. Early voting begins April 11th through the 26th. Election day is May 1st. Be sure to vote in the Republican primary, and thank you, and have a great night. All right, next will be Teresa Wright to speak with us this evening, and then we'll take a short break after this, and we'll uh, have the uh, debate for Sheriff. Good evening. I'd like to thank you all for coming out to support this forum, whether you're here or listening in, to learn more about the candidates that we have running for our county offices. I'd also like to thank Manchester Times, 
and WMSR Thunder Radio for hosting this event. My name is Teresa Wright and I'm running for Register of Deeds. I'm married to Emmett Wright. Most of you know him as Casey Wright. He is a captain at the Manchester Fire Department. He's with the, been with the department over 35 years. I have four children and seven grandchildren. I have a son, Chad Farrell, who is married to Shayla. They have three children, Jules, Jersey, and Justice. I have a daughter, Lachelle Farrell, married to Jared. They have four children, Kix, Kaya, and Kata Farrell, and Zach Nunley. Two more daughters, Amanda Wright and Kayla Wright. I'm also a second mom to Brad Davis, who is married to Julie, and anyone who knows them knows they have a house full of children. Growing up, I had a wonderful, shining example of parents. I had a wonderful childhood. My parents have passed on. They were Irvin and Thelma Green. <laughs> I'm, I was also blessed with a wonderful mother and father-in-law, Ada Wright, who has passed on, and John Wright. I have four siblings, a twin, Patricia Penninger, who is married to Wayne, Sandra Morgan, Mitchell Green, who is married to Ann, and Ricky Green, who is married to Helen. That tells you a little about my family. Now I would like to tell you a little more about me. <clears throat> I've lived in Coffee County all my life and I've worked here most of my career. I've been a business owner, a bank manager, a mortgage originator, a medical clinic director. I've worked in the auto industry and for a short time at Tolliver's Pawn Shop. I served as a chamber board director, secretary to the Manchester Industrial Board. I've been a Girl Scout leader, and a graduate of Coffee County Leadership. I have over 25 years in management and ownership roles. In these positions, I dealt with many of the instruments which are recorded at the Register's Office. Deeds, powers of attorney, releases, wills, just to name a few. This gave me a working knowledge of how the recording process is handled. I am qualified for this office excuse me, and I have a proven track record. I look forward to providing each and every Cobb County taxpayer who enters the Register's Office the best experience possible. I want everyone to experience the same feeling I had when I visited my aunt, Geraldine Lemons, and Jane Sullivan when they worked on the square at the Register's Office, and again when Ellen Vaughn was the register at its current location. As a young girl watching these ladies be so caring and helpful to the people in our community, it made me realize we are all in this community together and we should be helping each other any way we can. I have dreamed of serving Coffee County in this position for a long time. I believe my journey has prepared me for this, rule, this role. I am very excited about the opportunity and I am asking for your vote. Thank you. Okay, we're going to uh, take a short break for our radio audience and then get the uh, candidates for sheriff up here in just a moment. Um, real quick, just to let everybody know the situation here, same thing as the mayor's race. We've got everybody up here, but you're not necessarily going to see all these people on the ballot if you vote in the primaries, okay? Uh, we've got incumbent Sheriff Steve Graves sitting in the number two spot right here, and they drew numbers, and he'll be on the Democratic primary, and he's on a post until the general election. The other three candidates sitting in the first chair is Harry Conway, and then we have Larry Swan in the third chair, and Chad Parton uh, in the fourth chair, and those three will all be on the Republican primary ballot uh, coming up with early voting starting next week, and then the uh, or, or the uh, primary at the beginning of May. We'll start off by giving everybody uh, two minutes for opening statements, and then we will begin our round of questions. First up is Mr. Conway. 
As you mentioned, my name is Harry Conway. I'm originally from West Tennessee. I was raised abroad as a military dependent. I've uh, got a lot of experience traveling. I spent about a third of my life here in uh, Coffee County, Tullahoma, Tennessee. I actually enjoyed here. I've raised my children here. They went to school in Tullahoma and they graduated there. The reason why I'm running for a sheriff is I believe that there's a leadership issue at the sheriff's department. I think there's time that we need to adjust some things and I feel that the people would be best served with a, a candidate that uh, has leadership. Thank you. All right, that was uh, Harry Conway. Next we have uh, incumbent uh, Steve Graves. Hi, my name is Steve Graves. Uh, I graduated from Coffee County High School. I've lived in Coffee County all my life. After high school, I went to Montlow in Tullahoma uh, and then went on to MTSU and graduated with a BS degree in 1981. Uh, I'm married to Gwen Graves for 33 years. We have two children. I have a daughter, Nikki Graves. Uh, she's married to Toby Alonzo. They've given me two beautiful grandchildren. I have a son, Stephen Graves II. Uh, I'm proud of all my children and grandchildren. Uh, I went to work at the Coffee County Sheriff's Department uh, after graduating from college because there was a hiring freeze uh, by the state in 1981. Uh, I've been there 36 years. I became sheriff in 1998 and it's been a pleasure being there. Uh, I did think about retiring and uh, through the numerous calls and requests I had uh, and praying about it and then asking permission from my wife, I decided I, I wasn't ready to retire and uh, I, I hope to be your sheriff for four more years. Thank you. All right, that was Steve Graves and next we have Larry Swan. Good evening. I am Larry Swan, a resident of Coffee County pretty much my whole life with the exception of my service in the military. This campaign has been somewhat of a new experience for me, but one thing that is not new is leadership. And leadership is one of the main characteristics that a sheriff must possess. I began my career as a United States Marine. Once coming back home, I started my law enforcement career right here in Manchester. Over a period of 28 years, I held the rank of patrolman, sergeant, and captain. During this campaign, a lot of people have asked me why I want to run for sheriff. Our society and challenges of law enforcement are changing. The jail regulations and controls have changed over the years. The crime profile is different. Where meth was and still is an issue, opioids is now a crisis. The state of Tennessee is number two in the nation of opioid use. An active shooter is a common household name. All these changes have created a different challenge today, a challenge in which I'm up for. So my reasons to run for sheriff are more about where I see myself, not where I see Sheriff Graves in his current administration. I believe I have the morals, values, and leadership skills that I can make a difference in a society and a situation heavy with the burden of drug abuse. I believe I can make a difference in the employee morale. I believe I can make a difference right here in Coffee County. I'm not looking for a job, I'm searching for a challenge. These debates are a great way for each of you to get to know us and where we stand on certain issues, but this debate is not everything. I do believe for the most part, we all want Coffee County to be the safest place to live, go to school, and worship. We want our children safe, our employees to be safe, our homes, businesses, as well as our churches. All lives matter. It comes to safety. I want to thank each of you for coming out listening through social media or the radio, and thanks to Church at 117, the Manchester Times, and WMSR for hosting this event. Thank you. All right, thank you. That was Larry Swan. And next we have Chad Parton. Thank you. I would like to uh, thank Fantasy, or <laughs> Thunder Radio and uh, the Manchester Times for putting us uh, event on. Um, I am Chad Parton. I am running for sheriff here in Coffee County. 
I've lived here my entire life. I'm 45 years old. I'm the youngest candidate at this table. Um, I'm proud that my wife and my two kids are here tonight, my father, and I see a whole lot of friends here. Folks, I have uh, been in law enforcement for just over 20 years, and most of you have read um, our backgrounds. Most of you know all of us up here. There's a few of you here in this room tonight that don't know any of us. So you're going to be vetting who's going to be your next sheriff. And it's going to be left up to us to convince you that we're the ones to do it. I have worked at the sheriff's office and I've worked for a fine sheriff sitting over here beside me. A fine man. And a lot of folks think I'm trying to put him out to pasture and that I'm trying to retire him. And that's not my intentions. My intentions is to come in with a new set of views, to build a team. You, the citizens of this county, own the team. It's time for a new head coach, and I'm applying for the job. Thank you. All right, that was Chad Parton. Uh, real quick before we start the question, just a reminder to everybody that the way the rules are set up, um, we'll start with Harry Conway and work our way down. Then the next question, Sheriff Graves will take first, so on and so forth. I have two minutes to respond. We'll keep the time here. If uh, we need to allow some time for rebuttals and some conversation back and forth, we will allow one minute uh, as time permits throughout the night. Uh, but the first question will go to Harry Conway, and Rob is going to take care of that. Thank you, Josh. <clears throat> First question, we'll start with Harry. What qualifies you to manage a multi-million dollar budget that comes with sheriff and jail operations? I've been in law enforcement for 29 years, public service for 29 years. Uh, and during that time period, I've had the opportunity to do different things. Uh, not been a sheriff. Uh, <coughs> but I have done other things to qualify myself to run a jail or a sheriff's department. One of them being a private investigation agency out of Nashville. I, I did that for 10 years, uh, managed the budget, personnel, uh, vehicles, budget, everything. So I did that up there in, in Nashville uh, as a manager for a private investigation agency that was headquartered out of Memphis. I was in the military. I managed uh, personnel in the military. I was a staff sergeant in the Army. Uh, in Tullahoma right now, I'm an uh, investigation sergeant. And what I do is manage people there in Tullahoma Police Department. So I've got a lot of management experience, 29 years of public service. I know how to take care of people, what it means to take care of people. And with the budget that Coffee County provides to the Coffee County Sheriff's Department, I know I would do a good job there managing the money and the personnel. Thank you. All right, thank you, Harry. <laughs> Sheriff Steve, would you like me to repeat the question? Yes. What qualifies you to manage a multi-million dollar budget that comes with sheriff and jail operations? First off, I will not manage that budget by myself. Uh, a budget the size of the sheriff's office is a team effort. It takes my administrative assistant, it takes a budget department at the mayor's office, uh, and it's not something that, that one person can oversee and just uh, uh, know what's going on on a daily operation. Uh, like I said, it, it takes a team effort to uh, manage that, that size budget and, and that operation. Thank you. Larry, would you like me to repeat the question, sir? Yes, if you don't mind. What qualifies you to manage a multi-million dollar budget that comes with sheriff and jail operations? My wife and I currently manage, own and manage and operate 134 different pieces of rental property, whether it be rental property as far as residential or storage buildings. And uh, it's not quite $8 million, 
but uh, I do know how to spend money. Money's not a not a not not anything new to me. Uh, I'm also a conservative when I come to spending my money. I'm very conservative when I come to spend the taxpayer's money. So I do have a little bit of background on budgeting. And like the current sheriff said, I am married to Cheryl Swan, and I am going to have help. And if you know anything about her, she's an alderman, and she can nitpick a budget to death, and I will use her. Thank you. Thank you. Chad, would you like me to repeat the question? No, sir. Um, I worked in county government for just over 20 years. I spent two years out here at the Administrative Plaza as your emergency management and homeland security director. During that time, I managed a lot of homeland security money. I built a budget. I'm one of the few candidates other than the sheriff here that has worked in county government that has even dealt with a budget or turned a budget in. I managed thousands of dollars of grant money. We expanded a lot of projects with that grant money. A lot of that grant money was, was leaned towards the sheriff's office and a communications program. I have managed those jobs. I have worked at the sheriff's office and helped them in, in setting up their budgets. In investigations every year, they would come in and say, what do we need? What do we do? And we all had input. And it's like the sheriff said, it's a team effort. But folks, I'm in the private industry right now. And out here at Forest Mill where I work, I've got the sheriff's budget and three grain bins. I deal with millions of dollars of people's money every day, in and out. At the tip of a scale, I can break a man. So I have a large responsibility in the agribusiness industry that I'm in right now. And fortunately, I've got a family that is keeping me employed there while I'm out here campaigning. But my heart is at the sheriff's office. My heart is with the taxpayer. I am too a conservative, and I see a lot of places I can cut. I see a lot of things that I can improve. I want to build upon what Steve Graves has done. I think we can improve it. I think with a new energy and new blood, that can be done. So, you know, like I said earlier, when we opened up, you need to vet these candidates. And I feel that I'm the candidate that has the experience here in county government. I feel like I'm the candidate that has as much more experience in the private industry. And all that comes hand in hand. Not just being out here toting a gun and putting a badge on answering a call is what the sheriff does anymore. It's, it's business. And when you got 400 inmates and their families and this courthouse and serving civil process and keeping the peace, that's a lot of responsibility. And I'm up for the job. Thank you. Thank you. That was Chad Parton. Next question, we will start with Sheriff Graves. Sheriff, the issue of pay within the department uh, amongst road deputies and other positions has been mentioned many times on the campaign trail. Many feel that road deputies are underpaid in comparison to surrounding agencies, particularly Manchester and Tullahoma Police Departments, and allowing these municipalities to easily cherry pick away some of your best deputies. This is after the county often pays to train and even pays to send these officers to the academy. How do you propose increasing your deputies' pay while maintaining and minimizing the effects, excuse me, minimizing the effects on the taxpayer? Well, um, I, I think it's common knowledge that I've asked for raises almost every year at the sheriff's office. We started uh, with uh, studies in 2004 with CTAS doing studies to show the differ, different in the sheriff's department and the two city departments and also now we're in competition with the uh, AEDC police uh, which was police now is back to security um, a few years ago we just we agreed with budget and finance to do a thousand dollar across the board raise and the sheriff's department drug fund would take on all the vehicle and the uh, equipment. We did that. Uh, that raised them up a little bit, not where they needed to be. Uh, the county paid for the Thompson group to come in and do a, uh, a study. It took three years to get that in effect and, and it brought the officers up just another small amount. This year I've sent a letter requesting another thousand dollar cross the board raise for the county deputies and the, uh, the department. 
after talking to Mayor Cordell, he uh, suggested that uh, instead of using the thousand dollar across the board raise, that since this is the year that the step raises go into effect, which is two percent, uh, that we do a three percent cost of living raise. I'm, I'm okay with that. That three percent will not only go to the, the deputies, but uh, it'll go across the board to all county employees, which is uh, not just the deputies, I think, that's underpaid in Coffee County. I think it's uh, most of the county employees. I know the ambulance service is one of the lowest paid ambulance services around. And, uh, you know, we're willing to help with that. Uh, the money will come from a uh, new inmate phone system that, w that we've been installed in the jail, and um, I, think it, I think that would be a start. All right, thank you. That was Steve Graves. Uh, next to Larry Swan, do I need to repeat the question? If you don't mind, please. All right. The issue of, of pay within the department, uh, the Sheriff's Department has been mentioned uh, several times on the campaign trail and it's been in the news lately. Many feel that the road deputies are underpaid in comparison to surrounding agencies, particularly the Manchester and Tullahoma Police Departments, allowing these municipalities to easily cherry pick away some of the best deputies by offering significant pay increases. This is after the county often pays to train and send these officers to the uh, police academy. How do you propose increasing deputy pay while minimizing the effects on the taxpayer? Reorganization and nickel and dime in the budget to death is one way. The other way, and I believe it's going to be the best way, that they will see a substantial amount go into their pocket and not into uh, insurance companies. Now with Obamacare, not all but gone. It's kind of been repealed, but the, but the penalties have been waived. If we can search and bid contracts out, but it can't be just through the Sheriff's Department. I've got to get department heads throughout the county. There's several uh, employees that work for the Coffee County as a whole. If we can get insurance companies to bid to get our contract, when you've got a man and a woman that have children and they're paying eight to nine hundred dollars a month, if you can cut that in half, that's four hundred dollars that they're putting in their pocket. That will be another way. So those two ways, I believe that I can do that without asking the 21 commissioners and the mayor for a dime. Thank you. All right, thank you. That was Larry Swan. Uh, next is Chad Pardon. Chad, do you need the question again? No, sir. Okay. It is, without a doubt, we've got to streamline at the department. Um, I've seen the department get so top heavy in the last few years. We cannot keep creating supervisors positions. We've got to bring it back. We've got to bring it back to simpler times. Our, our county hasn't geographically grown that much. We've increased in population. We've increased in a few calls. But we cannot continue down the road that we're going at the department. We're going to have to streamline positions. We're going to have to consolidate. We're going to have to bring some folks together. And some folks are going to have to go to work. It's plain and simple, folks. Go to work. Get up and go to work. We can't have cushy jobs for everybody. We can't make everybody happy. We have to say no. And that's tough decisions to do, but it's got to be done. So when we cut and we align some positions and we create some responsibilities and consolidate those responsibilities, those monies are going to be spread. Those monies are going to be spread to those corrections officers. Those corrections officers start out at 1187 an hour. 1187 an hour. And you got patrolmen out here just over $14 an hour. They put up with a lot. And the ones that are working will work. You could can, you can send a, several home and you'll never see the stats change. I know, I've been there. I've seen the clock watchers. It's got to stop. You've got to go to work. Now, one of the opponents said something about insurance. Look, that, that's a county-wide project. That's not an individual project that the sheriff can do. Yes, the sheriff can have a voice with the other elected officials and department heads, but that boils down to the process of meeting with the county commission. And I have to say that 
the insurance is high. But when you compare it to other companies out here, or other family plans, it's pretty compatible. I don't think that we're that far off. There's some things that can be improved. Those are just things that we've got to work with. But we've got to start inside the sheriff's office. We've got to start and consolidate, streamline. Thank you. All right, Chad, thank you. Let's uh, come down to this side for Harry Conway. Do you need the question again? No, sir. Okay, go ahead. Larry and Chad covered it pretty well. Uh, that's what's going to have to be done. you got to streamline and you got to put it together into a package that it, that will work for everybody. Uh, you don't want to raise taxes to, to raise uh, pay raises either, so you got to work with what you have. Now, I know the sheriff has had some tough times and, and, and dealt with some issues as far as personnel, but I think the streamlining is the answer that, to that question. Now, you have a disparity between pay on Manchester and Tullahoma and the Sheriff's Department that can get up to between 4 and $5 an hour. Uh, that's, a, that's a big chunk of change as far as a family man goes or a family, family woman, however you want to put it. Um, streamlining is the best way to go. But as far as the health insurance, as a sheriff, I think the sheriff can work with the county commissioners and come up with a better health plan or options for health plans as far as family goes. So in a nutshell, if you can work together, and I'm talking about the county commissioners and the sheriff's department, to come up with something that's beneficial for the employees so they can raise their families and have better pay, I think that's the way to go. So Larry and Chad are correct. Thank you. Thank you, that's Harry Conway. All right, so this next round is going to be a little bit different, and then we'll get back to some uh, group questions in a moment. But these will be individual questions. Uh, these are questions that were submitted uh, by the public for each particular candidate. We'll start with uh, Larry Swan. You'll go first, Larry. Uh, Larry, you've mentioned on the campaign trail that you can reduce health care costs for the jail by checking on pre-existing conditions when inmates are brought to the jail. Do you still believe this is a viable option? I believe it is. I know that I've talked to a gentleman in the audience. I won't mention his name. Keep going. Sorry. <laughs> I thought I'd talk longer than I have. That was, that was quick. Uh, that was quick <laughs> start, start over. <laughs> I, I don't believe that when somebody comes in and they're booked in, and you ask for their, uh, the rundown of their health issues and they give you something that they've had for 10 years, I don't know how that's a taxpayer burden. So yes, I'm going to look into it. it. It's all about the taxpayer. We look after these prisoners and we seem to forget about victims and taxpayers. So yes, I stand that ground. If it's a pre-existing illness, I think that it should be looked into because I've already talked to a couple of sheriffs that do it now. Maybe not at the tune of 400 personnel, but they do it on a smaller level. So if it can be done at a smaller level, I think it be, can be done at a larger le level. Thanks. Thank you. That's Larry Swan. Uh, up next, this question goes to Chad Parton. Chad, you have promised to place an SRO in all county schools without increasing the budget, saying that it can be done with the current personnel at the Sheriff's Department. Could you provide more specifics for how you can make that happen? Yes, I'd be more than happy to give specifics on that. Right now, currently, we have three deputies that serve civil process. That's their full-time job. You know why there's three deputies that are serving civil process? because that's where they've been moved, because they might not be physically able to do the other jobs as patrol, or they're older, or they don't want to do something else. So we create jobs for them. We're going to cut those three deputies out. We're going to take realign those positions. That's three of the six that we're going to need for the schools. Now, I'm not saying I'm going to take those three process servers and put them in as, as an SRO. No, we're going to realign. When we cut these captains, all these captains we got, and all these lieutenants, and we cut that out and we streamline and we consolidate responsibilities. Hey, we might even come up with seven if we do it right. We might even have that extra one to go to the high school. 
Ladies and gentlemen, the first day, if I'm lucky enough to be elected sheriff of this county, the first day, September 1st of this year, there's going to be deputy sheriffs at every one of these elementary schools. And I'm proud to say that the chairman of the Coffee County School Board did a press release with Thunder Radio today. They're going to present a resolution at their next meeting encouraging the county commission to accept and work on funding for these SROs. Well, Mr. Mayor, if you're still here and any city commissioner, I don't need your money. You save that money. You save that money for building materials to secure the doors. You save that money to cover the glass. You save that money to buy textbooks. I'm going to give you deputy sheriffs with what we got. We're going to tighten up and we're going to do it. Some folks have got to go to work. That's, that's it. We got to go to work. If you can sit up here by my office at Forest Mill for two and two and a half hours a day doing whatever it is you do, deputies, you got time to be serving papers or going to a school. I'm tired of seeing it. I didn't do it. I don't expect anybody else to do it. We're going to work. Thank you. Well, thank you. That's Chad Park. Uh, next question is for Harry Conway. During a forum last week, you mentioned that there is a lack of trust between the community and the sheriff's department. Can you clarify and provide more specifics to validate this claim? Since last year, I've spoken to a lot of county, Coffee County uh, residents in Tullahoma and Manchester and the county as well. The comments that came out throughout time is that the Sheriff's Department has dropped the ball on a lot of stuff uh, regarding services. We're talking about the issues at the uh, courthouse, uh, some of the issues as well. And then overall some services that just not perform properly. And the citizens are upset. And in the process of being upset, they'd like to have services. We pay a fairly high amount of property taxes, so what do you get? I look at the taxes that you collect, that paid out to the Sheriff's Department, and then what kind of services are delivered. So a citizen has a right to uh, have an opinion and have a say to some point. Now, I would say May 1st and August the 2nd, that'll come out. But in the process, sometimes we lose a little trust, a little respect for agencies, and this is what's come out in those conversations. There's a way to get around that to correct it. There's professional standards that need to be instituted. Uh, training needs to be improved and there's some uh, equipment issues that need to be adjusted. Thank you. Uh, thank you, that was Harry Conway. Um, before we give Sheriff Graves uh, his question, we're gonna give him an extra minute on his time being the incumbent he's getting hit on a little bit from all corners, so we're going to give him this question then an extra minute uh, in, in the answer if he wants to, to address some of the claims uh, that the other candidates have made. You know, all, all I'd like to say is that if, you know, I've got, uh, I've got a wife, a daughter, and a grandchild in the county school system. Uh, you know, if I thought they was in danger, I'd be over there myself watching them. Uh, all I have to say is that if Dr. McFall wants to open up a dialogue, I'd be glad to sit down and talk to her about that. Also, when, we get, when we're talking about service of process, we, those process servers serve over 1,600 warrants a week. I mean a month, I'm sorry. But uh, that's a lot of process. And these attorneys in, in town, if you do not get those served, they, they are not happy. And uh, the court system basically shuts down if uh, some of these things aren't done. And I'd like to say that I think the Coffee County Sheriff's Department has some of the most loyal, trustworthy uh, officers that, that I've ever seen. And I'm proud of every one of them. Thank you, Chair. Uh, here's your question. Uh, Sheriff Steve, an inmate was able to overpower a transport officer, take his gun, and shoot two deputies at the Justice Center last summer. Could there have been a better operating procedure in place to prevent this, and what internal changes 
uh, if any, have you implemented since then to prevent further incidents such as this one? I would first like to say that uh, the officers that this happened to, uh, I hold no fault to him whatsoever. Because when a man is so desperate to chew a man's hand almost off and spit the tendons out on the ground, uh, I think that officer did all he could do. And after those injuries and he was shot, he took his taser out and tried to locate the gentleman before he did any further damage. Uh, I, think, I think those officers are, are warriors. I'm proud of both of them. Um, and there has been more certified officers put in the courtrooms. We are careful on our transports more now. And we've also asked some of our, we've got some of the finest reserve officers uh, that you could ask for and they're helping in the court system now. So uh, there are things in place, it's gonna take a while, but uh, uh, I'm very proud of the two officers and uh, we're, we're so lucky that, that we didn't lose two officers that day. That was Sheriff Steve Graves. Next, uh, we'll start with Chad Parton uh, on this next question. The newly constructed jail is already at or near full capacity. What can you do as a sheriff, if anything, in conjunction with the district attorney, judges, and other relevant personnel to reduce incarceration and the stress on the jail infrastructure and medical costs, which are proven to increase as the uh, population becomes overcrowded. Right now, currently, I think about the uh, yearly cost per inmate is just over $15,000 a year per inmate, so that's what, like $42 a day. We've got over 2,000 people in this county on Mr. Minor probation. And I think I'm on the record here in this county in a in a jail review and law enforcement committee meeting when the, they were talking about the jail and I went to that committee meeting and I stood up and I said, do you really know why you're building a new jail? And I had stats from our own system, from our own software. And at that time, 30% of our population was misdemeanor violations of probation. 30% of misdemeanor violations of probation. We've got that many misdemeanors in our county jail. When we went from privatized probation to county probation, our stats, our inmates population skyrocketed. It didn't take but two years and the sheriff was calling, we've got to have beds, we've got to have beds, we've got to have beds. We've got to go back and look at the root cause of the problem. Our county probation system, in my opinion, is not working, it's loading us up. When you've got 2,000 people on probation you could go out here and build a 2,000 bed jail and the judges can violate them and you're going to be in jail. So we've got to work on that. Have I got to be a mouthpiece to go in there and show them that? So be it. I've done said it. I'm on the record. We've got to reduce these costs. We've got to. I've got to disagree with Gary Cordell. Tonight he mentioned about shutting the workhouse down. Mr. Mayor, that's a mistake. We need these inmates out here working. We got plenty of trash to pick up. We need to expand that workhouse program. We need to get our work release program going. If a man gets a DUI and he's got to go out here and spend a weekend doing 48 hours, why can't he? We don't want him to lose his job. I want him out here in the workforce. I want work release. I want him to go into that jail of a night or a day so he don't lose his job. We've got to work on that. Remember, probation, keep people working. Thank you. All right, that was Chad Parton. Uh, we're going to bring the same question down here to Harry Conway. Do I need to repeat it? Yes, sir. Okay. If I can find it. There we go. The new jail is already at full capacity. What can you do if elected sheriff, if anything, in conjunction with the district attorney, judges, and other relevant personnel to reduce incarceration and the stress on the jail infrastructure and the increasing medical cost, which are proven to go up as the population becomes overcrowded. With uh, Coffee County would be the greatest asset, and I'm talking about all the government agencies and the nonprofits. You have social service issues that come to play. You've got a lot of uh, 
mental illness issues in the inmates that come in there. A lot of it, quite frankly, is not addressed. Now, you can have a jail and you can put 500 people in there if that's capacity, and, and if the judges uh, have folks that come up to them violating the law, they have to address it as well. So I think it's a collaborative effort between all parties or all agencies involved. I don't think the sheriff alone can accomplish that and reduce the numbers. You're going to have law violators, and that's just the way it's going to occur, and you can't be lax, but you can't be too severe either on, on, on both ends. So you got to find a happy middle ground. you got to work with your fellow agencies together in the justice system. And I think if you work collectively, you can solve a lot more, pro a lot more problems that way. So uh, probation, the uh, sheriff's department, the DA's office, and the court systems, they work together and they do a pretty, go pretty good job now, but I think we need to focus a little bit more on social services as well, mental illness. Thank you. All right. And that was Harry Conway. Uh, next is Sheriff Graves. Do I need to repeat that one? No. Okay, go ahead. Um, I agree with uh, Chad. Um, we do need to keep the workhouse open because that is a way to shorten the sentences to the inmates. We are legally able to give two-for-one credits for inmates that go out in the community and work uh, on a daily basis. Something we've started last year is we had 51 inmates receive their uh, high school equivalent diplomas while at, incarcerated in the jail. That, by state standards, we can give them 30 days credit for that uh, diploma. Uh, any program we can do to shorten their time and to help them not to be uh, one of our inmates that comes back in a, in a month after they get out of jail, I, th I think benefits not only the jail itself, but also all the taxpayers of this county. And uh, we do need to keep the work programs going. All right, thank you. That was Sheriff Graves. Next is Larry Swan. Larry, do you need the question again? If you don't mind, please. Okay. The new jail is already at full capacity. What can you do if elected sheriff, if anything, in conjunction with the district attorney, judges, and other relevant personnel to reduce incarceration and the stress on the jail infrastructure and to help reduce medical costs, which are proven to increase as the jail population becomes overcrowded. They say it's, it's roughly 75% of your jail population are your repeat offenders. And it's usually drugs or alcohol related. There are programs out there to get help, and I'm all about help, as long as they want it and ask for it. It's the ones that don't want it that I'm gonna concentrate on. Jail is supposed to be a time of dread factor, not a comfort factor. I plan on making their life a little less uh, desirable while they're incarcerated. If I can take certain privileges away to stop the revolving door system, that's what I'm gonna do. But for the people that want the drug court, the veterans court, I'm all about that. Matter of fact, I'll push for it but it's the repeat offenders that I think need to be held accountable for their actions. And that's maybe tougher, a tougher time while they're incarcerated. It's a jail, not a daycare. I will defend Gary for a second because I know a little bit about that situation. There's currently 15 to 16 prisoners at the workhouse and they've got 12 or 13 guards that work there. And I think that's where the problem lies. He's trying to reduce not as many guards, therefore cutting some, not necessarily cutting jobs, they could be used somewhere else. But when you got 13 people guarding 15 people, maybe that's a little extreme. And these are work release people that we allow to go out and pick up trash and whatnot. So I think that's where Gary's headed with that. And I'm not, knocking Steve and I'm not knocking uh, Chad, but that does need to be looked at because it is a huge cost to the taxpayer. Thank you. All right, thank you gentlemen. Uh, my time is up. <laughs> we'll start with Harry on this question. <clears throat> 
With school shootings becoming a greater concern nationwide, outside of SROs in every school, do you believe the Sheriff's Department is properly trained and equipped to respond to a similar situation in our county? I would agree that the Sheriff's Department is currently not equipped to handle a first response to an active shooter situation. The reason why I say that is because you have to have adequate training and you have to have that training maintained and you have to have that involved with the different, well, the school system for being one, but you also have to uh, engage the community as well. You have to provide a community service for businesses and, and uh, daycares and any other location that has a, a large group of folks that are in the building and be a uh, victim of active shooter situations. So I, I do not think that the current Sheriff's Department as is is adequately equipped on the training level to respond for active shooter. Thank you. Thank you. That's Harry Conway. Next will be Sheriff Steve Grant with the same question. Would you like me to repeat it, Sheriff? Yes. With school shootings becoming a greater concern nationwide, outside of SROs in every school, do you believe the Sheriff's Department is properly trained and equipped to respond to a similar situation in our county? I most definitely do. We have very well trained deputies and we also host a uh, uh, active shooter training for our officers on a yearly basis. We also have some things in place that we do not make public uh, that makes me feel better about a couple of our schools and I wish we could add some things to the other schools. But yes, I most def definitely think we're, we're ready and able to respond to that type of situation. Thank you, Chair. Larry, would you like me to repeat the question? If you would, please. Yes, sir. With school shootings becoming a greater concern nationwide, Outside of SROs in every school, do you believe the Sheriff's Department is properly trained and equipped to respond to a similar situation in our county? I've worked with Larry Floyd. I saw him in here somewhere. I saw Kelly Smith and some more officers, definitely. I've worked with them. I've trained with them back in the day. So, yeah, I believe they are. Uh, I do believe the training, it's all about training. Uh, maybe more than once a year, possibly twice a year, but going to each school in the county and even each school in the city, learning the layout of the school so you know exactly what you're doing when you get there to be effective. That's the most important thing. Also want to uh, hit on the city and the county developing a team in order to react together. Because there's no doubt in my mind if a, a, a school shooting breaks out in the city limits at a city school, there's no doubt in my mind Larry Floyd, uh, Kelly Smith, and any other county officer will respond. That's just what we do. And, and working together and proper training, but the learning the layout of the schools is very important. So yes, I believe they'd be very effective. Thank you. <laughs> 